as a person connected to the field of sustainable development. Everywhere I go these days, I'm expected to speak about the subject of sustainability. The problem is, however, that for the past few years, I've been suffering from a very serious sustainability fatigue. And I'm pretty sure this disease is contagious. Every year, I speak to about 5,000 managers, business owners, executives, politicians, sometimes academics, sometimes media. That's a big number. What unites me with these people is the fact that what we feel sustainability movement has offered us in the past years is nowhere close to the challenge our global economy is facing. The challenge is tremendous, and sustainability concepts are simply too weak, too frustrating, too limited in their thinking. So what is that that we're facing? If you think about our global economy and imagine it in all of its complexity, it looks like this, one big horizontal line. We mine or we take something outside of nature on one side, we use it usually only once, and we trash it at the end of the day. So if you think this whole and imagine this whole is our global value chain, all of our miners, all of our agriculturists would be on that side, and then all of the companies here would be processing all those materials, usually only once, and all the way to the end, those would be the wonderful people who own the landfills. Maybe not very glamorous, but definitely very financially sound job these days. So this economy has been constructed like this for the last few hundred years, but it is collapsing. If you think of the fundamental problem we're facing, it is that we are running out of things to mine, and we are running out of places to trash. Now, of course, majority of us have heard this story before, and most of the story starts with oil, gold, and all other resources that are disappearing. But those resources we at least track and are able to manage. We at least have an approach when, how, and why will we adjust to a world without oil. But there are other resources, and across the board, every single resource is disappearing. Take, for example, food. Anybody here who doesn't eat? <laughs> no? Well, if we look at the studies of what's happening with our food across the board in every country, year after year, we're losing nutritional value. This is just one example. Over 20 years, 43 different crops, that would be tomatoes, potatoes, and on and on, have been studied. In 20 years, we lost 6% of protein, 16% of calcium, 38% of riboflavin. Today, we have 20% late, less vitamin C in our food. In 20 years, we can imagine tomato that is as beautiful, as red, as ripe as it is today, with absolutely no nutritional value. And it's happening across the board. Same is happening with our species. If you think about 19th century, we were losing approximately one species per year. By 1975, we started losing about 1,000 species a year. At the beginning of this millennia, we were losing about 40,000 species a year. We're predicting absolutely no commercial fish beyond 2048. Any resource you take, whatever we take out of Earth, is on the brink of extinction. Now, that's this side of our linear economy. What about this side? What about the beautiful owners of our landfills, of our wastelands? Well, if we look at the old world, one country after another is declaring that is running out of landfill space. England recently said that it has about six, seven, eight years left. And you can say, well, England has been with capital economy for the longest. They should suffer from the fact that they trashed the entire land. But that's not only an issue of old countries. Dubai said that it has a few years left. So a very new economy is facing the same problem, absolutely no wasteland left. If you look at our oceans, for example, today, and drag the ocean gyra for plankton, you will find six times more plastic than plankton. We are running out of things to mine, and we are running out of places to trash. 
this linear throwaway economy is collapsing. And the question for any business owner like myself, what am I supposed to do with this? How am I supposed to adjust? Now, sustainability movement has been looking at this question quite intensely. And if you come to any sustainability professional and ask that person, what should I do? What should be your response in my company? Majority of them, very proudly, would say, go green. This is the way forward. This is the cutting edge idea. Now, let me ask you, what comes to mind if you think about green product? Just imagine, what comes to your mind? A green product. I'll make it more palpable for you. Imagine a green eco shoe. What comes to mind? Is that product beautiful, fashionable, compatible to the traditional eco shoe, traditional normal shoe? Few of you are laughing. That probably is an indication that it's not so beautiful. Now, is it as research and performing as well as the traditional Nike or any other sport shoe? Many of you are shaking your hands and saying, probably not. What about the price? Is it <coughs> price competitive? Absolutely not. In majority of cases, it's more expensive. This is our beautiful example of an eco shoe. This is a product that was launched in 2012. <laughs> as majority of you can see immediately, it's ugly, it's underperforming, and it's overpriced. This is what we call green product. We put it on the market, and then we are surprised. Why is that product not selling? Isn't that obvious this is the next big business opportunity? Aside from Tesla that is standing outside of this building, very few products are trying to do something that is on par with performance, on par with design, and on par with price as the traditional counterpart. So this kind of green is simply unsustainable. Now, if this kind of green is unsustainable, is there a different approach? Of course there is. But even if we move into products that are more competitive to their traditional counterparts, there's something fundamentally wrong with the concept of sustainability itself. It just doesn't have that kind of visionary reach, that kind of richness of emotional appeal that you need when you're thinking about the linear throwaway economy. So let me illustrate that for you. Imagine that yesterday evening you had a great dinner, right? So the dinner was great, great food. A few of you are shaking your heads, so you probably had a great dinner. So after the restaurant, you're walking on the street, and you see a person who you used to live to next door, and you became good friends, but you haven't seen for some years. So you're catching up, and you're sharing how's life, you know, how's How's your work? How's life in general? And the question comes up, how's your marriage? Sustainable. <laughs> There's something fundamentally wrong with that word. If sustainability is the big pedestal that we would like to reach, if this is the top of the mountain, it just lacks the appeal. We don't want our marriages to be just sustainable. We want to, them to be amazing. We want them to be outstanding. We want them to be whatever is the word that drives us forward and gives us energy to pursue. Now, if we think about what's going on in the world, as I said, I'm probably not alone who is suffering from sustainability fatigue. Year after year, I'm looking into companies or working with companies who are trying to find a way out of that fatigue and cure their life. And they are trying to do that because they look at the research similar to this one that says customers are also catching on and the big green wave that we had for a few years is dying out. While many customers say they will buy a green product, when they actually come to the store, they don't do that. No more than 4% of them does. So we need to go beyond the unsustainable green and come up with language that will be really appealing, come up with models that will be really revolutionary, and that will give energy to everyone involved, whether you're employee, owner, customer, community at large, whatever you might be. Some of those companies are working in the shoe business indeed. This is Puma, and when they started working with this field, they didn't go for the shoe itself, they looked at the packaging. Very simple question, how do we pack our product? Their thought was very simple, why do we first pack our shoes into big boxes, 
then ship them to the store, and in the store, they're put into a bag, which is also a big bag, only for the customer to come home and throw out that product in a matter of a second. Why do we invest our money into a product, which is a packaging, and to a bag that is completely unnecessary and is being trashed within a second? Why don't we create a packaging that is saving us valuable resources, that creates additional value for our customers, and that brings a, a new appeal to whatever we do? Because when the customers look to the clever little bag, that's the way they called it, they say, well, if the packaging is so intelligent, imagine what's inside. This tiny, tiny innovation saved amazing amount of paper, electricity, transportation cost, and on and on and on for the company, but it also became a product that the customer could use because they can pack their shoes when they travel into this bag, they can send their students, their children back to school with this bag. And this is a tiny example of what's going on that goes beyond the unsustainable green. But Puma, of course, is not alone. Across the world, different companies are looking into this question. For example, Microsoft today is researching a way to use its data centers, their data servers, as furnaces in houses. Now, what is the problem with traditional data houses, the data servers? The problem is overheating. Across the board, you will notice that a lot of money and a lot of valuable resources is being spent in cooling down the data servers. Why don't we take each individual server and put it into a building? It radiates heat, it's a normal furnace, and by the way, it will still serve as a data server. Can we think of a radical different ways to structure our business? Flow2 is a different <coughs> company, it's a startup, but their concept was very similar. All of our businesses have unused resources. Some of us have unused rooms in our buildings. Some of us have unused labor force in our employees. Some of us have cars or any other resource. Why don't we create an online platform that will be secure and safe and include insurance for any business to lease out any unused capacity that they have in a very simple and very transparent way? Throw Grow Confetti is a different type of product. It's a tiny product. It's a very simple product, but it is another illustration of a different kind of thinking. Confetti is a pure waste, so if you buy confetti for your children for a birthday and you throw it around, that's just a whole bunch of money on the ground and a whole bunch of pollution. Throw grow confetti has seeds embedded into biodegradable paper, so if you just wipe it away in your garden, it will produce a beautiful, beautiful combination of flowers. Now. This kind of thinking can be called anything, but it's definitely not <coughs> the traditional ugly, underperforming green that we're so used to. Some companies call it resourcefulness strategy. This is the word recently chosen by OMV, uh, Austrian gas and oil company. Eco-superior is a language that is used by trend watching, one of the best consumer research companies that I've ever met in the world. Now, design hotels, a group of companies, call it infinity strategy, with a completely different language and completely different appeal, emotional, visionary appeal. Many companies call it different ways. I happen to call it overfished ocean strategy. <laughs> I believe our oceans are getting empty, and there is a way to turn it around. Now, for the last few years, I've been studying and working with companies who go in this direction, and I notice five things they do radically different. It's a completely different mechanism for powering up innovation. And when you combine these five different principles or five different secrets, you will notice that the speed of innovation in your company or your community or your country changes drastically. So what are they? First of all, Secret number one, to move away from line towards a circle. This concept is not new at all. Nature is a circle economy. When I die, my body becomes food for somebody else. And those organisms produce food for something else. Nature is circular. Similar with our technological world, we need to figure out a way to make all of our products transfer in a circular way. Show Carpet Tiles is one such company. 
Instead of sending their carpet tiles to trash at the end of a life cycle, they discovered and figured the chemical composition of a carpet that can be infinitely recyclable and created a very easy way for their customers to bring the carpet back so that it can be produced in a circular loop again and again and again. It takes them no more than a few hours to disassemble and then disintegrate and fully recycle the old carpet tile into a new carpet tile. It's a circular economy, and it's economy of abundance. Two, the second secret, to move from vertical to horizontal thinking. Now, what do I mean by vertical thinking? If you think about our big linear economy, majority of us are taught to think in our little vertical slice. This is where we look around at our competition, and we don't really worry about our suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers, or the customers of the customers of the customers. But that's where a lot of value lies. This is an image of the emissions that were permitted under the different EU regulation. The big picture is EU1, 1993. That is how much emissions our cars were allowed to emit. This is 2013, EU6. Imagine the pressure that is on our automakers to rethink radically the way they will innovate. BMW answered this call by radically and aggressively entering into energy field, producing energy. It's no longer a car company. It's not even just a mobility company. It's an energy company. And they do that because thinking in a horizontal way allows them to expand the opportunity and come up with solutions that are much more successful and much more uh, solid than the traditional ones. Third secret, from growth to a different kind of growth. Traditionally, when we think about our companies, we think in terms of products. The moment you move towards processes, solutions, and services, you rethink the whole business. Rolls-Royce, a company that is as product-oriented as you can imagine, stopped selling its airplane engines and started leasing them. On one end, they can take the air engine back and refurbish it and rebuild it so they don't lose valuable resources. On the other end, it's a total solution for the customer because they don't need to finance it. You can close the loop in the circle economy, but you can also create a much more appealing thing for your customers. Notice in 2010 already, Rolls Royce started making more money on its services, not products. I will wrap up very quickly with the last two. They are more difficult. The secret number four is to move away from planning to modeling, and the secret number five is to move away from department to mindset. Both of them are the different types of mindsets that we require to develop. But I'm pretty sure that this kind of thinking is the one that is ahead of us. And I am pretty sure that if we don't go towards a different type of economy, the different type of economy will drag us there. I hope that at least the community I see ahead of us is the one that will be the pioneers rather than victims of the new world. Thank you very much.